Man, I'm excited about the, uh, the, big, the big party we're going to be having next week. It's going to be at the park right next door, so when Sarah says over there, it's not going to be like in you know, uh, Edgewood or anything. It's just the park right next to our building here, and I'm pumped about it. And we're going to find a way to baptize you no matter what. You heard there's going to be water games, so Pastor George is going to be going around with water balloons, baptizing people, so uh, you may as well sign up, just saying for a regular baptism. Hey, um, we're in this series called uh, Mark, and it really is exploring the question, who is Jesus? Because the answer to that question, I think, uh, has a huge impact on the shape of your life, on your identity. And um, if you were with us last week, um, we jumped in um, with, this, with this aspect of the story, this beginning of the story, where, where Jesus is baptized, Jesus is actually baptized, you know, he didn't sin, he didn't need forgiveness of sins, but he was baptized to, to really be um, declared as the Son of God, and, and in that baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down, it's this crazy thing, and it says that the heavens split open, you guys remember this? And in the book of Isaiah, it, it really is the answer to Isaiah's prayer, this prayer of the heart of, that where, where, where tough things have been happening, hard, some of the toughest stuff that you, you could imagine, Isaiah is crying out to God to, to rend the heavens, to split the heavens, our, our reality, you know, unravel our reality and bring heaven to earth. Come and change things. Come and save people, save us. And then when, when we join or start the book of Mark, we see that God immediately is rending the heavens that he is splitting them wide and bringing heaven to earth through his son, Jesus. Jesus is God rending the heavens and coming down to our world, amen? Pretty cool stuff. So that's where we were last week, and there's this idea within that passage that, that there is God, and he is at work for those who wait for him. And waiting's hard, and so there's these implications of waiting on God that are just difficult, and so the passage we're, just, we're uh, talking about today is really going to be answering that question, how do we wait on God? How do we do it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What, is it, what are we looking for when we're waiting for him? And so that's going to be the passage today in Mark chapter 1. If you'd just pray with me, we'll jump in. Father God, we just thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for every soul that's here, Lord. I pray that, that we would have uh, our hearts fully open to hear what you want us to learn, where you want us to change, what you want us to do. We pray all these things in your name, amen. So Jesus is baptized. The Holy Spirit comes and lands on him. Everyone sees this. It's like this crazy moment, and then all of a sudden this voice, like, I don't know what the voice of God sounds like, but I bet it's pretty scary. Like in other accounts of the Gospels, people thought it was like thunder, but this voice says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased my beloved son. And um, it's actually in verse 11. A voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy in this translation. Then the spirit compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness immediately where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and the angels took care of him. Now if we just stop there for a moment, it's really kind of bizarre moment. Jesus is lifted up. This is like victorious moment where he's being declared, this is my son. I'm gonna do special things through him. This is the one I love. And he's lifted up in front of everybody and the Holy Spirit comes down, rests on his shoulder. That'd be pretty cool, Holy Spirit right here. And, um, and then this voice calls out who he is and what he's about and how much God loves him. And then it says that same cute Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness with Satan. This is one of the most bizarre um, turn of events at the beginning of a story you'll ever read, all right? This is, this is bizarre. You read this story, this is God's son, that God's gonna do great things through him, and then he's like, I love you, son. Holy Spirit, lead him into the wilderness, into the desert, where Satan tempts him and tests him. So Jesus goes from like this mountaintop experience all the way into this valley, how many of you guys have been following Christ for some period of time? 
There's some of us here. I know that some people, maybe it's new or you're kind of exploring. But if you've been, if you've been following Christ for any amount of time, those of you raise your hand, how, how many of you have experienced that time where like God does some amazing things in your life and you experience, experience some victory? And then after that victory, all of a sudden you get taken into the wilderness. How many of you guys have experienced that? The wilderness isn't fun. I hate being in the desert. I hate it. I mean, there's, I've had friends who have had those, those same mountaintop experiences, and then all of a sudden something in their life happens. God leads them into a place where there's real trial, there's real testing. I mean, like sometimes you can literally say, man, is, Satan is here. God, why would you leave me here? And this is God, this is Jesus. Why would God lead him there? Why wouldn't he just send him out on ministry? Because we know eventually Jesus goes and heals people. He preaches. He uh, turns the whole world upside down. He helps the, the poor and the underappreciated, the ones who've been cut off from normal society. He helps reconnect them and connect them to the living God with this coherent, amazing kingdom faith. But before that, Jesus gets tested. It's pretty interesting, right? Why would God do that? Why would he allow that? My, my family, um, this summer specifically, in the beginning of the summer, went through a desert time. I don't like being in the desert. I don't like being there. It's been hard. We've had to, I've had to, my wife has had to feel things that we didn't want to feel. We've had to think about things we don't want to think about. We've had to kind of like try to just coast and we're around people at times when you don't feel like everything's fine. You you don't, want to, you, know, you don't want to bring other people into the desert all the time, and so you, you sometimes have to be like, no, everything's all right. You kind of have to try to turn that off, but it's still there. So we can be in the desert without looking like we're in the desert, right? And I think our lives are like that. I mean, one of the, I think one of the hardest things facing people, this isn't just Christians, this is people, is that we have this life and, and, it's, and it's only so long we get, we're born and then life just starts going up and down and up and then like there's huge ups and there's big downs and, and, um, and then all of a sudden life's over at some point. You know, give or take a few years, we'll probably live 70, 80 years, but that's our life and it's this up and down, there's these waves that go up and down and, and many people, I think when they, whether they're people of faith or not, they look at it and they're like, man, what is going on? They have a hard time making sense of their life. They have a hard time making sense of the ups and downs and, and sometimes our emotions lead us into the great ups and downs and sometimes really bad ideas lead us down and sometimes really good ideas will lead us up but we're, we're so like creature of, creatures of habit, creatures of of emotion, creatures of, of you know, our imagination, and, these, and, and, and all the while our lives are going like this. And a lot of people, especially people who have lost faith or struggling with faith or have no faith, what does it mean? It, just, is, it, it, it seems so random. Can there be meaning behind this? Is there really some, you know, is there really some higher power? Is there really this God who's behind all this, this life? We called it last week the life of dominoes. There just seemed like my life's just being controlled by other forces. And this is the world that Jesus enters. I love that God doesn't like send Jesus into the world and he's like untouchable, doesn't experience any pain, doesn't, you know, doesn't experience any of the hardships. Like no, Jesus is sent into the real world has real problems and he experiences those in full, like actually more fully than we do. I don't know about you, I've never had the Holy Spirit just land tangibly on me in a way I saw and then led me into this desert where Satan tempts me. I mean, that's not a cool place to be where Satan is tempting you. And just really, this is kind of maybe an aside, but for, for those who might be interested in the biblical story, where have we seen humans tempted before? By Satan. Back in the Garden of Eden, right? Remember Satan comes up to the, to the first humans, Adam and Eve? He comes to Eve first and he starts tempting her and they both end up giving in. They both give in to the temptation. One of the reasons I think Jesus is being tested is because he has to succeed temptation where we have failed. He has to experience the worst of the worst and have victory so that through him we can have victory. I think Mark's saying Jesus is the true human that we were meant to be. God had to send him, he had to send his son, the living God, 
Jesus Christ to sacrifice himself, go through the muck and the mud of this world and come out victorious where we have failed. So, it says he's among the wild animals and then eventually angels took care of him. Eventually he passed the test. And there's a testing that's come. How many of you guys have been through some tests with your life? How many of you guys maybe have recently gone through some of those? A few of us. It's hard. But I love that afterward he's ministered to. Another translation of this says the angels ministered to him. Then immediately in verse 14 it says, later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee where he preached God's good news. He started his ministry. After he was tested, after he was ministered to by angels, then all of a sudden it's time for him to start his ministry. After the time of testing, like there's this stealing of his character, there's this stealing of, of knowing his identity, and he goes forward in ministry in an unbelievable way like he's never done before. He has unleashed on the world to preach good news. And when I read that, I'm like, what good news? I mean, he's just been through some really tough times. What good news does he have to preach? Well, let's look in verse 15. It says, the time promised by God has come at last. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. I want to camp in this section for today because I think there's some, if we, if we can kind of dig in, I think there's some things that can radically change our lives. How do we learn to wait? How do we learn to navigate these ups and downs of our life? How to make sense of it all? How to put it together? Is it just randomness or is God actually doing something in our lives? How do we begin to see what God is really doing? How do we learn the art of waiting on a God who is working for us? So the promised time by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. I wanna just go into that. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God, he's saying, is it's like so close you can taste it. It's like so close to you. It's like in your blind spot, you can't see it. It's like the car that, that, that comes up from behind, you can't see it, and you start turning, whoa, it's there. The kingdom of God, if we, if we back up uh, to verse 10 in chapter one, it says, as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart that's what he means when the kingdom of God is near it's here like God is splitting apart um, areas of our universe areas of our world uh, individually collectively where he is breaking through and he's breaking old bad things and he's renewing and he's and he's fixing broken things that he loves the kingdom is breaking in can you see it if you back up in verse 15 it says the time promised has come, the time promised by God, a time that needed to be fulfilled, the time that, that people have been waiting on is happening now. Isaiah's prayer that, God, would you come? Oh, would you rend the heavens? Would you come save? That's happening now. Now, it's really important to understand this word time, this word time, and some of you guys have heard me talk about this, but I just think it's so crucial. There are, there are two words in the Greek language for time. One of the words is called chronos. Chronos is, is like chronological. It's where we get the word chronological, chronos. It's this time that's like clock time. It's, chron- it's sequential, uh, one to two to three to four. When, when you know someone who's a really bad storyteller, how many of you guys have friends who are terrible uh, storytellers? They can just never get to the point. They're like, oh, oh let, me, let me tell you about my day. I woke up and then I got out of bed and then I drove to school and when I was at school I opened the books and the teacher taught me about science. When I was <gasps> at science I learned that the, you know, about moles and they start telling me about all these things and, and then when I got home I went to this, the grocery store and the grocery store had all these options and I looked at the, I mean, and you're just like, get to the point. Have you ever been like that? Like, like give me the thing. Some of you guys are looking at each other like you got some bad storytellers and I'm sorry. My wife, I, I work on like if he ever starts getting real boring, you just add a shazam, you know, or just kind of look at him and do this, this kind of motion and then keep going because it'll at least put some kind of energy into the thing. But give me the thing. Kronos is, is that where it's just monotonous and it's, it, it's part of life and it's, Kronos is, you know, it, it's cyclical. You know, the, every day I, I know that, that three o'clock's gonna come. You know, God willing, if Jesus doesn't come back tomorrow, three o'clock's gonna come. 
and then four o'clock's gonna come, and then five o'clock's gonna come. Like there's predictable time that we live in. How many of you guys know that? How many of you guys have been in school and you're just waiting for the, the, the clock to tick, 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 and finally, boom, the bell to ring and you can get out of there? Because we know that there's this chronos time. The Greeks really understood that. But it's interesting in this, in this story that that's not the time that it's talking about. You see, when it says the time promised by God has come, when Jesus says that, he's talking about another type of time. It's called kairos time. Kairos time, interesting word, right? Has even more interesting meaning when you dig into it. Kairos time is like these moments that have meaning and impact and they're unpredictable. They're these opportunities that come. They're moments even sometimes of maybe temptation. You can never predict them, but, they, but when they come, you either see them or you don't and you experience them. They're like a wave that comes in. They're these opportunities. I, I like to think of them like windows of opportunity to change you. And sometimes these moments can change someone for the worse. Sometimes it can change them for the better. It can shape their character. It can shape the course of their life. And all of a sudden, if you start being able to recognize Kairos time, instead of just like feeling like everything's random or crazy and there's, where, where's the meaning in all this, if we can start to see some rhythm behind things, if we can start to see Kairos time, that God is fulfilling things in our world right now as we speak, our lives are altered and the meaninglessness changes. All of a sudden we can start seeing some meaning, even if it's hard. All of a sudden we can start seeing our purpose, even if it was hazy before, even if it's maybe not the purpose we wanted. God, you want me to be that, to do that? Are you kidding me? I can't do that. No. And also when the Kairos time comes in, it, it changes our perspective because we can all of a sudden see the kingdom that's breaking through. My family loves to surf. We got to Westport and we surfed. I remember when I first learned to surf, it wasn't in Westport, it was actually down in California, Morro Bay. I went out, rented a board, I'd gone down with, some, um, with my family and I was about 16 and um, my dad gave me some, a few minor instructions what he remembered when he learned in eighth grade, when he lived in San Diego, when he was a kid. And I had this board, I had the wetsuit and I went out in the water. I remember when I first, the, the cold shock of the water, just immediately, my whole body went rigid. I had this board, the wind's blowing. It's this big long board. It was like one of those foam ones, big blue foam ones I was learning on. I was just kind of moving with the wind. And there's all these real surfers out there. I'm just this noob, right? And, uh, you know, I can see as they walk by me into the, into the water, they kind of give me that look like, oh, man, he doesn't know what's going to hit him. Like, and stay over there, kid. You know, this is my territory. So I, get the, the, I tried to get the board in. I turned it the wrong way, and the wave just went and hit the board right in the face and knocked me over. I remember just sand everywhere. And then when I tried to get up, another wave came. You know, because if you don't keep your head on a swivel, like, you're going to get hit upside the head when you're surfing. You got to keep your head moving so you're paying attention. I just wasn't. I was looking for my board because that had just hit me in the face. And I didn't want to get hit in the face again. Then, boom, I got hit right with a, a wave, right in the side of the, you know, right in my ear, you know, this ringing as I got up and um, another wave hit me and it took me down this time into the sand and ground me up in the sand just like, just like I was hamburger. Have you guys ever surfed or boogie boarded? You guys know what I'm talking about? When you're first learning, like if you know nothing about, I'm like, dad, why didn't you teach me about the waves? And I was just getting ground up, came up for air, <gasps> Boom, hit again. Finally, I, I, I kind of crawl to shore and I look back and the waves that seem so big are like, you know, that big. You know, I was just like, <gasps> <gasps> and all these people are looking at me, you know, it was slightly embarrassing. I had a choice. Am I going to give up or going to keep going? So I went and grabbed my board and went out. Eventually, I paddled out far enough, not super far out, big enough where waves could take me. And, I, and I, uh, a wave came and I, I just tried to jump on it. I think it was the grace of God. I caught it. And I stood up, and I was like, this is amazing. I mean, my first real try out of wave. Looked around, you know, and it was just like the whole world stood still. It was just beautiful. I don't know if you've ever caught a wave, but it's, it really is only like 15, 20 seconds. If you're really good, it's like a 30-second ride. But it was just like everything stood still, and there, this beautiful you know, rock, you know, in Morro Bay, it, it was there. And I, the seagulls, and all of a sudden, this otter came up next. I'm not joking. An otter came up next to me. It was like... And that freaked me out. And so I immediately did the worst thing possible and jumped into the water. 
um, which I realized, like, this thing can swim and, and, and get me. And, uh, and they're big suckers. They're bigger than I thought, you know? And, uh, you know, I grabbed onto my board, and then I went out, and I couldn't catch a wave, like, the rest of the day. I couldn't catch a wave. It just, I was getting knocked around, or I'd think I'd catch the right one, and, and it would just peter out. And, so, and you'll learn, like, if you ever surf that, if there's waves, two waves are close to each other, even if it looks big, even if it looks great, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die because these two waves end up killing each other. So you have to, you have to learn how to catch the waves. It's cold, sand and cold water are going into places you can't even imagine. Surfing, it's tough. These waves come. I think that Kairos time is like that. I think there's these waves that come into our lives. The question is, when God brings these waves, are we ready to catch them? Are we ready to catch them? Do we see them? Do we know how? Have we learned it all? There's nothing worse than having someone yell at you from the, from the beach how to surf. I remember my dad at one point, he's like, you need to do this, you need to do that. I'm like, I'm in the water trying, you don't, you're not doing anything, don't tell me how to surf. And I eventually, you know, you, you wanna pick up surfing from people who actually surf, right? It's, it's awful, and I love that Jesus, who's just been in the desert, with Satan, he's just been in the highest of high and gone to the lowest of low. He comes out, he says, I got some good news for you. The kingdom of God is here. There's some waves that are coming. There's some waves that are coming into your life. Some of them will be tough, some are gonna be great. You'll love them, but they're all gonna be shaping who you are. The kingdom of God is breaking, and I got some good news for you. I love that Jesus is like a, a, an actual teacher who's in the water with a surfboard, having gone through everything, telling us, telling his disciples, there's some good news, I'm gonna teach you how to catch some waves. I'm gonna teach you how to see the Kairos moments in your life. That's powerful, right? I hate it when you have people like, that you know, are all decked out in beach gear and their, their surfboard's all waxed up but it's never been in the water and they're yelling at you from the beach. Some of us have been on the beach and Jesus, when he was living, the, the, the beach yellers were the religious ones, the Pharisees. You should do it this way. You should do this. You should do that. But they weren't really in the water. They didn't really know how to see the waves. They didn't know how to catch the waves. They didn't know, like, they didn't know how to surf. And we serve a Lord and Savior. We have the opportunity to serve the Lord and Savior who wasn't just on the beach yelling at us. A lot of people look at God that way, like he's just judging and kind of yelling at us to, you need to do it this way, and when you don't do it right, he checks out. No, 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 he sends his son to show us in the water how to catch waves. The time promised by God has come at last. I had, um, when you think of these waves, like what do they look like in our lives, you know? What do, how, how do we learn to read these things? Because they can, they can be the moment of, of a birth or they can be the moment someone dies where God uses that to speak to us. In Jesus' story, it's like he can be baptized. Everything looks awesome. And then he gets led into the desert and he's tested. What do these things look like? I was talking with a guy recently, this last week, and I, I just had to share this with you. Um, and his f- faith story up to this point was, was this. He um, grown up, and he started struggling with addiction. And when addiction set in, I mean, it just gripped him so bad. But there was a moment in his life where all of a sudden God gave him a family. He didn't expect it, didn't feel like he deserved it, but God gave him a family, gave him something to live for. And this moment came in where he realized, I'm gonna have a son. And it was like this wake-up call. I mean, God was using this thing to, to get his attention. You need to change, son. Sometimes it's pretty obvious we know what it is, right? And he, um, he started praying. He started asking the Lord to help because he'd always kind of believed in God. And he actually went to church and started uh, filling out connection cards and letting them know, hey, I need help. I need, I, I'm gonna quit. He started quitting whatever his addiction was, whatever, some of these things that were pulling him in. And he was like, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Drink, no, this, no, no. 
but he was like waking up in sweats. He was waking up where his body was craving. I mean, it was just so hard and you he needed help. He's like, I need community. He's never had Christian community. He felt like God was saying, that's what you need to do. So he went to go try to find it and he got nothing. He said he turned in card after card and I, you know, always, you know, as a pastor, I'm like, oh man, I want to make sure our church doesn't do that. And he talked to person after person and no one was really responding to the need in his life. So he kind of checked out. There was like this wave that came in and he just didn't, didn't connect. And so the wave just went by. Eventually he, um, so he was helping his uh, uncle uh, at an estate sale, help, help him clear some stuff out. And, um, and the guy who was kind of running the estate, estate sale, who owned the place and his father had passed away, asked him, hey, could you help me with this thing? And he kind of looked at this thing and it was like this major thing. And he was like, well, I don't have anything else to do, so I'll help you. After he helped the guy, the guy was like, you know, that was really difficult what you just did and I couldn't have done it on my own. And I don't know too many people that would have actually taken me up and actually helped me with this. But I couldn't have done it on my own and I'm really grateful. Would you, wanna, would you have time to work for me on the weekends? He's like, yes, I, I need some extra work. Yeah, absolutely. And as they began working together, the guy said, hey, I don't want to bother you, but um, do you believe in God? Have you ever had someone ask you that? Do you believe in God? Especially if you don't know him super well, it can be a little awkward. But he was like, well, yeah, I totally, I, I totally believe in God, I, but I've, I've just never connected to the church. I've, you know, had some bad experiences there, and, but I'm struggling with this, and, I, I, and he started telling a little bit of a story, and the guy's like, well, he's like, I'm old. I got some friends. They're old like me. They're all like 60 years plus. But we meet at this old Catholic church once a week or every, every two weeks. Would you want to come meet with us? And he's like, this is what he'd been wanting. He was just like, man, is, is, is someone following me? And so he said, yeah, sure. Started to meet with this guy. He started growing, started changing. Then there was a period of time where he kind of wandered away a little bit more. And he was uh, working at this, uh, for a family member and started uh, clearing out this house that just was like packed with stuff. Just full of stuff. I mean, it was like hoarders, he said. It was just like full of things. So he's like trying to get this house cleared and everything. And all of a sudden, it starts pouring rain. It's this old little cottage. You know, leaks are all in this old place. And it's leaking on everything. He's just like as miserable. And he was ready to go. And his eyes caught this sight on this desk. And where this big leak was coming in through the, door, through the, through the roof, he saw this um, Bible. Saw this Bible. Huh. And he had been feeling like, man, I need to get back because he was, he was struggling. He needed a community. He wanted to, to, to be in a place where God could change him and to the man he knew he wanted to be. He was like, he saw the Bible and he was just like, no. Turned around and started walking away. So he walked a few, about 10 yards or whatever, and then all of a sudden just stopped in his, his tracks and was like, it can't be coincidence. I've been needing this. I've been walking away. Uh, and he felt like he needed to go grab that thing. Felt like he needed to go grab that thing. So he turned around, went and grabbed it, and it was right next to where the leak was. Then it was totally dry, luckily. It was like the only dry spot on the desk. And he flipped it open. And then when he looked at it, it was like this really cool old Bible. And it was used in a prison ministry because it had all these like prison ministry information. And he was like, oh no, maybe the Lord's telling me this isn't my future. You know, like I'm gonna be in prison. And he was like, what am I gonna do with this? And he saw a number on it. So he called that number. Guy picks up on the other end. It was like a pastor, ministry kind of guy. And he's like, hey, who is, who is this? This is, this is John. Hey, I found a Bible. And he's like, where, you know, where, where are you? I'm, I'm calling. I found this Bible, and maybe I should return it. I don't know what to do. And the guy's like, I'm in Port Orchard. Where are you? And he's like, I'm over in Puyallup. And he's like, well, I don't need that Bible. I, you know, I gave it to someone. And he just kind of was silent on the end of the phone looking at, his, at this Bible in front of him. And the guy on the other end of the phone, he doesn't know, says, do you think maybe someone's trying to get your attention? Do you think someone's trying to get your attention? See, Kairos moments, when these waves come in, God is trying to get our attention. And sometimes we've so trained ourselves or we've become so used to just paddling and hanging out in the water, not catching waves that we don't really see them anymore. And there's maybe some Christians in here who have never really surfed or never really learned how to surf intentionally because you just let the waves go by. Imagine if my friend that I'm talking about, if he had just kept walking instead of going at that Bible. Because the rest of his story is he realized God was trying to get a hold of him and it led him to connect with a guy who connected him with a guy at Whitewater. And he's back in community. And God is changing his life. And he's got 
He's got things and he's got joy that he hadn't had before. He's got a place that he hadn't had before. God's speaking to him in ways that hadn't happened before. Imagine if he had just kept walking and let that wave pass him. I think we get so used to just letting the wave wash over us. We don't see it. We let it go. We get so used to being in Kronos time where, you know, most of surfing, if we were just honest, they shouldn't call it surfing. They should call it like, like paddling and waiting. Because you're just out in the water and you're fighting the current and it, you get soaked and you're tired and you're cold and then for 30 seconds if you're lucky and you see it and you know what to do you can catch this wave for just a moment but when you get done surfing what do you tell your friends about what do you tell your family about i caught this wave like and it was amazing it was like i was on top of the world and then i totally biffed at the end but it was amazing and then i went and caught this other one you don't tell them about like the hour in between For those 30 seconds, sometimes faith is a lot of waiting and paddling. Sometimes ministry is a lot of waiting and paddling. A lot of people who have been doing ministry, and you and you maybe you've got people that you're discipling, you'd want that breakthrough to happen for them. Or you've got people that you've you just want to see find Jesus. You want God to break into their life and and bring forgiveness and grace and love and change them. And you're you're like, come on. And you're just you're just waiting for the breakthrough and you're tired, you're tired of paddling, and it's cold, it'd be easy to just give up. But I wanna tell you that there's a wave coming. Are you ready for it? Are you keeping your eyes to the horizon? Are you looking for it? Are you ready to catch it? How do you catch a wave? Simply this, it says at the end of verse 15, repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repent and believe. It's this idea of turning from where you're going and heading a new direction. It's this idea of saying, I'm not gonna go this way, I'm gonna go this way. Repentance, the two questions I always ask with repentance and belief is this. What is God saying? What is God saying to me? What is he doing in this moment that he's trying to change in me? And what am I going to do about it? That's how you catch a wave. It's being, it's being able to answer that. What is God doing? What is he saying to me? Oh, there, like this is really tough and I didn't wanna go through this, but he's teaching me patience. He's teaching me how to really love. It's teaching me how to really receive his grace and just wait. Like this mountaintop experience, he's teaching me that I need to go. I need to get up and go. He's teaching me that I've been sitting on the beach telling other people what to do and I'm not even in the water. There's some people here today that, that you gotta get in the water. You gotta, you gotta start throwing yourself in and learning and learning the, the craft, the art of waiting, seeing the Kairos moments, seeing the waves of God and catching them. What is God saying to you? What are you gonna do about it? Wanted to just close on something real practical. Um, Taking a little bit too much time this morning, but just ended up on something real practical. Um, I don't know too many people who become great at catching waves, great at having faith in God when they're going through the real down times. Staying close to God when everything's good, when it's easy to walk away from him, you know what I'm saying? I don't know too many Christians who have a vital relationship with the Lord who don't spend time with him, who don't spend time in reflection. And uh, my dad, he actually keeps a prayer journal. So when it's like Kronos time and he's waiting, he's like, Lord, could you please, could you please, could you please, this is really hard or I'm waiting, I don't know, when's the next wave gonna come? And he writes it and he prays about it and he uses the Bible, the Bible's language even to, to pray about it, the Lord's prayer or other prayers that he has and he writes and he asks God for things and he, and he says, God, this is what's going on, this is how I'm feeling and he writes his experience. God, this is what I'm feeling and I want, I wanna know what you're saying to me but this is what I'm feeling right now. And he writes it every day. Wakes up at like 5 or 5.30. This is, he let, let me have this. He's got terrible handwriting. He's like, don't let anybody read it. And I was like, Dad, this is better than the, the German's enigma. No one, could, could you read that? Are you kidding me? But it's his journal. My grandpa Eldon had one like this. He gave me a bunch, well, a bunch of journals. He gave them to me. And I, I've been blessed to have these men of God. And the ones who are the closest, they reflect on them. I'm not saying, not everybody's a journaler. And I, I get that. But have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried to keep record of what are the waves that God is sending into my life? Um, we, I want to give you something um, today. You don't have to take this if you're not a journaler or whatever. But um, we have these journals that we had made. And we want to give them to you as a gift. 
So that this month, when we're getting you know, out of the summer rhythm, we're getting back into, into school and work and life, and it can be so easy to let our faith kind of slide and let the wave slide by. What if, what if we took time, like when getting in the word, reading in the, in the Bible, reading through Mark with us, there's other resources I'll be talking about in the coming weeks, but just start reading, read a chapter of Mark a day um, and start taking notes. What's God saying to you? Answer those two questions. What's God saying to you? What are you gonna do about it? What's the wave that he's got you in? What's the wave that's coming that you're feeling? What's the wave that just left? What's God speaking to you through scripture, through friendships, through your life, through community? And and start keeping track of that. So I'm telling you, when you look back at things, you'll be able to see questions and requests that you have. You'll be able to see your prayers answered. And you won't miss it. You'll be able to, to make note of major turning points in your life where you can look back and say, I changed here. I went back and grabbed the Bible. I called the guy and God was trying to get a hold of me. Does that make sense? I want this as real practical. So as you leave today, we're gonna have some people handing these out. Grab one, please. This is a gift. Let me pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We just give all glory to you. I ask that we would would get good at catching the waves. We'd get good at seeing the waves as they come. Lord, for many of us, the time is now and we've been, we've been acting like it was yesterday. We're acting like, oh, it's sometime in the future, but it's now. I pray that anybody who's hearing from you, some area of change, something in their character, something in their life, Lord, and maybe it's, they're in the pit, maybe they're in the testing time, maybe they're in the high time. I pray that they would act on it. What are you saying to them? What are they gonna do about it? I pray this in your name, amen.